Do you know why they call our forces the United Nations peacekeeping forces? Because Marx and Lenin both defined peace as, and I quote, the elimination of all opposition to socialism, end quote. How about that? Did you know that many years ago there was a document written by the United States State Department called State Department Publication 7277? with an introduction by Harry Truman, who admitted in that introduction that the stated and avowed policy of the United States government is to create a world government. And in that document, it outlined in three stages the bringing together of the military forces of the Soviet Union and the United States to create a police force of peacekeepers, which would be the only military force in the world under the United Nations? Did you know that NATO was created as a United Nations force under the auspices of the United Nations Charter, and that the Warsaw Pact was also created as a United Nations force under the auspices of the United Nations Charter? And that was stage one. We are now in stage two, where NATO is bringing in the Warsaw military forces, the Warsaw Pact military forces, into the NATO organization. Until this unification is completed, the military forces of the United States are acting as the world police body, the peacekeeping forces for the United Nations. How many of you know that the United States created the United Nations? Members of the delegation of the United States wrote the United Nations Charter, and it's almost an exact carbon copy of the Constitution of the old Soviet Union. Who pays most of the money to foot the bills for the United Nations? The United States of America. We're behind in our payments, but nevertheless, we're the ones who foot the biggest portion of all of the payments. Where does all the money come from that's being flooded into the Asian nations to try to stem the economic collapse? Now, that's what they're telling you, but the truth is, they're pumping that money into the Asian nations, knowing full well that they can't stop it from collapsing, but that the pumping of that money will help create the inflationary terror that will destroy the economy of the United States of America in the near future. Where does all that money come from, ladies and gentlemen? The International Monetary Fund is pumping it out, but who's pumping it into them? As usual, it is the United States of America, always has been, always will be. The International Monetary Fund is not a business. It's an arm of the United Nations. Did you know that the Secretary of the Treasury of the Treasury Department of the United States of America is the Governor General of the International Monetary Fund. Were you aware of that? Well, of course not. No. There's nobody in your high schools or colleges who teaches you this stuff because they don't want you to know it. You're not supposed to know it. If you knew all this stuff, you could not be so easily controlled and destroyed. But it's all there for anybody who wants to look. All of it. Nothing is hidden. There are no secrets. Believe this, if you never believe anything else in your entire life, ladies and gentlemen, there are no secrets. It's all out in the open. Believe this also, you idiots who join organizations and they tell you right up front, you'll never know anything about those organizations until after you've become a member and taken a blood oath I'm talking about the fraternal organizations and secret societies that many of you belong to. That's pretty stupid to join something you don't know anything about. And they tell you right to your face, you're not going to know anything about it until you've committed yourself and taken blood oaths. 
And don't tell me that crap that you spout that the oaths don't mean anything. They're just ceremonies. Grown men don't take oaths that don't mean anything. If your oath doesn't mean anything when you take it in the lodge, it doesn't mean anything in court, on a witness stand, or anywhere else in your life. Maybe that's an admission of your true nature and your true character. An honorable man does not take an oath of any kind unless he means it. Listen to me. There are no secrets. The only secret in the lodge, if you get to the highest degrees, is how to use the promise of a secret to control all of those idiots down below. How do you like that? Makes you mad, doesn't it? Well, write me a letter. <laughs> write me a letter. Yes, sir. Like the IRS said, we're here to help you. Send us a fax. <laughs> Write me a letter. Love to hear from you. Don't you just know it? And speaking of hearing from you, if there's anybody in the Great Plains, the Northwest, the Northeast, or the Southwest, who is listening to this broadcast and would like to give me a reception report, I would like to know if you can hear this broadcast on shortwave. Please call 520-333-4578 right now and let me know. That's 520-333-4578 and let me know. So that uh, I can tell if this earlier time is doing us good. I already know this is doing good in Wisconsin where they couldn't even hear it last week. And in Miami where this is really strange. Uh, if you're close to a shortwave station, you usually can't hear anything they're broadcasting because shortwave skips right over uh, a close proximity area. And the, the transmitter is in Miami. So, it's nice to know that we're coming in loud and clear in Miami and in Wisconsin. I would like to know if we're coming in loud and clear anyone else, anywhere else. If, if you're bashful and you don't want to call in on the air, call this same number tomorrow. And either talk to me or leave the message on the answering machine because I really want to know. Uh, I need to know. Or send me email. You can send me email at uh, harvest at harvest. All that kind of stuff. Hopefully soon we'll have a chat room. We're working on that. HTTP colon slash slash harvest. I've seen one, except maybe a picture in a book of the original Constitution, which is extremely difficult to read even when it's its original size simply because of the archaic style of handwriting back in those days. And it's not printed, it's handwritten. So, aside from seeing a picture of it, most of you have never seen one, never read one. They don't teach it in our schools anymore. Those of us who were in school when it was taught generally didn't pay too much attention. We all took everything for granted around here. So on this broadcast, we're going to get into the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the amendments. We're going to talk about it. We're going to study it. Oh, yes. And we're going to talk about this, this treasonous art of interpreting the writings of geniuses who were so careful in the selection and the meaning of the words that they chose that they left absolutely no room for interpretation whatsoever. And in the early days of this country, there were no interpretations of the Constitution. Everybody has to understood exactly what it meant. Nope, that didn't start until this century. In the 1900s, people began to say that they could interpret the Constitution. One of the reasons is, is that most people don't know the original meanings of the words that existed when those words were written. They also don't understand that words in their legal context generally and usually have a completely different meaning than they do in the popular vernacular. So when you're talking to your friends or at work or making a speech somewhere, you're using meanings of words that have an entirely different meaning 
in a legal dictionary, in a court of law, in a document like the Constitution for the United States, and a lot of other things. The best way to determine the meaning of the words written in the Constitution for the United States of America, the Bill of Rights, and in the laws passed by Congress is to obtain an 1828 Webster's Dictionary. All of the meanings were the same up to that point. After that, they began to change. 1828 Webster's Dictionary. You can do a search on the World Wide Web and come up with a place to order it. Um, and you may be able to order one from your local bookstore because it is in print. Yo, yes, sir. We're starting to reprint a lot of books that a lot of people don't want reprinted nowadays. And you can get some of the most important accumulations of the sum total of all of the knowledge of the human race now that they have been trying to destroy and keep from you from, for many, many years. The library is no longer such a great place. You'll find that many of the most important books in this country's history are disappearing from the shelves of the libraries throughout the country, along with early law books that knew what the Constitution said. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. It's Pat in Connecticut. Hi, right, Pat. How are you? Good. How's everything? Uh, well, it, it's okay. Let me put it that way. Your reception, I didn't have you here for the first half hour or so. Yeah? It was nothing at all. Do you have this now? Uh, it's on now, but uh, it, it fades in and out. Okay. From, like, really good to uh, intel unintelligible. Do you, have, do you have an outside antenna? No. Okay, that's what you really need until they get the new antenna going, which I understand is not going to be too far in the future. Good. Well, it's great to hear you again anyway. Thanks, Pat. You coming to, our, you coming to this year's conference? I'm planning on it. Well, I hope you do. Yeah, I want to. Good. Okay, I'll be talking to you. Thank you for your reception report. You're in Connecticut, right? That's right. Thank you. Okay, good to hear you again, though. Good, good night. Bye. That's Pat. Pat C., I recognize her voice <laughs> from Connecticut. She was at our last conference in 1997. By the way, our next conference is in May of this year. It's going to be the week of Labor Day. And uh, if you want to come, you better start making your vacation plans and uh, getting your money together. Good evening. You're on the air. This is Monica Kimball calling from California, and I'm calling to give you a signal report. we got about uh, S2 and noise and otherwise, and great modulation. Wonderful. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you very much. We appreciate your show. Well, I appreciate your calling in to, to let me know that. All right. Well, thank you. That's wonderful, folks. At the later time, nobody in California could get us ever. <laughs> so I'm very pleased with that statement, which means that uh, anybody in between should be getting this broadcast. And like all shortwave broadcasts, sometimes listening is an art form. I used to sit out in my backyard with my shortwave radio and have to put one hand on the antenna, one hand on a pipe in the ground, stick my leg up in the air, and let the dog sit on my foot. And that's the only way I could listen to shortwave radio. And uh, folks, in some areas with some radios and some antennas, that, it is, that is not at all an exaggeration. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill. Eastern Long Island. Uh, just like the guy from Connecticut, the first part of the show was uh, not good. Picked you up at uh, about uh, 8.45, and the show before you was very clear, and then right at the top of the hour, massive static came on. <laughs> but, uh, by like I said, I walked away from the radio at 8.23. I came back to it at 8.45, and I could hear you good talking about the Warsaw Pact. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you having that kind of reception problems, you need an outside antenna, a long wire. If you don't have enough room outside, you can string it up in your house. And one of these nights, I'll tell you how to do that. Uh, but we're out of time, folks. So I want to thank you all for being here with me nice, once again. Very the nice and, time. and pretty Good long night. for a change. Indian summer we had here has come to an end, unfortunately, because winter is really kicking in tonight. It's actually below the freezing mark. And... That's really normal for here, I suppose. 
Indian summer is when it kicks in later, and like a, it's almost like a second summer, and sometimes it lasts for weeks, which it did this time in the late fall, into the pre right up to the present time. And for the last couple of days, it just changed in sudden rain, uh, cold rain, that really cools it down. And then in comes the frost for tonight, and possibly some flurries even. But there you go, that's how it is, isn't it? We truly are living in a, <laughs> I've mentioned it so many, I gave so many talks over so many years on the big boys at the top and their eugenics agenda. And it's good to see others have grabbed this now and gone with it and making some awfully good documentaries, in fact. And it's stuff I did verbally, basically, on the radio many, many years ago, to do with, with the groups behind it. And the American side, too, had their groups all affiliated with the, the groups in Britain. Because in London, really, that was the home of eugenics for an awful long time, before anybody else really kicked in, at least in the European sphere. You've always had eugenics involved in royalty and even certain groups or tribes within Britain and Breed and so on. But this whole idea of creating a future society worldwide uh, run by eugenicists was a fairly novel thing. It came in to fruition in the age, actually, of, of what would you call it really, planned society of the 1800s, they came out of the Industrial Revolution where they brought in all the time and motions expert and efficiency experts, etc., that they used in the factories, and then they got them together and said, do the same thing now for all of society. Look at society and see what we can do about it. And you would see all, H.G. Wells was one of them too, and he talked about them quite a lot. He, he hated the working class, even though he, he really... <laughs> in a sense, belonged to them. His mother worked as a housekeeper for a wealthy family. She was like the upper maid type thing. And he he got a good education out of that family, certainly. But he was terrified when he looked every day at the workers passing his window on their way to factories and, and really dangerous and dirty jobs and so on. And that terrified him so much, he, he despised the working class. Odd thing that that what you should what you really despise you can often become, and that's what he did. He joined the Fabian Society as a propagandist too, which really is, a, as far as I can tell, was a wing, the left wing of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, because they run all sides. The same group runs the CFR for America, and they run the European International Affairs Institute too for the European Parliament. They run the whole world now, and they really came to the conclusion that they, they should improve the stock, the breeding stock of humanity. They wrote lots of books and papers about it. They did bring in sterilization, compulsory sterilization, in the States especially, for the so-called feeble-minded, even though the, those who they were sterilizing, uh, it turned out in many cases, were not feeble-minded at all. But it got it going, and in Britain they did some as well. It's never really stopped. There's many ways to sterilize not just people, but animals too. The same groups that set up the Eugenic Society in the States under the Rockefeller and all the different amalgamations of groups that, that were into all this kind of thing for improving the stock uh, and running the world properly, as, as he said, with the right people in charge, which was themselves. They did mention that the Cold Spring Harbor, they made a base there for an experimental base for all the record keeping of different stock of American citizens, for instance, across the country. They would get census reports and even had spies out who would bribe officials to gather medical information on people in different towns across the U.S. as well. Today they have internet, of course, and the idiots actually will, will, will go, they go looking for their genealogy on Facebook. And then you'll see in Facebook too, they're actually in to, to genetics, for goodness sake. Hasn't it twigged on you what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hasn't it twigged at all? You help them, don't you? That's the sad thing about it. If totalitarians come along and say, we're going to make you do something, well, you're going to say, oh, no, you're not, and you're, you're all peeved about it. A good term, that peeved, to get peeved. But if they say, oh, this is free, come in and find it, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, it's exciting. Uh, they just rush in. They just rush in like crazy folk and give all their data out there, and they have no idea.
that it's also shared with those who are, who are bringing down the National Health Service, for instance, in Britain, and bringing in compulsory uh, euthanasia for those who are uh, possibly, possibly terminally ill. You don't even have to. If you're a bit depressed now, they can give the pill in some countries. And that's what they're pushing for all, for Britain. Britain's had some kickback, so they haven't rammed it through. But there are, there are countries, I'll touch on that tonight too, are all into this. Because it's time now just to bring, start bringing the population down. And for those who really believe in this global society where we all live in some Disneyland, and all society that suddenly changes and they're nice to each other, well, continue with your delusions. It's okay. You're allowed to have delusions. But uh, no, it's not going to be like that at all. They're going to bring the population down across the board. It's so specific now, and I've read the articles too. How many times have I read them? Remember, go into the archive section at cuttingthroughthematrix.com. There's so much material there. Everybody's using it. And you go into other talk show hosts, they're in there all the time. Boom, 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 boom. Folk making videos. Boom, 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 boom. On and on it goes. Because the material's there. And as I say, there's nothing really that they have. Whatever they, they, they've, they've planned many years ago, even 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, they're still doing it. They never back off and change. This never happens. Never happens at all. Everything they do is perception management. Always stop that. You know, now you can, then, then they come out with, let's collect your, your, your DNA and your, your, your genealogies through this free program, etc. I make it fun. Let's go on and on and on. And at the same time, of course, your governments are all saying, oh, well, it's an end. Oh, we can't afford. We can't afford to keep everybody going in pensions anymore. We can't pay their pensions. All my life, I have listened to politicians, as little as possible, mind you, but I've listened to them repeat the same things. <laughs> 